I hope you caught what she was doing for us at Metal Lark Media and Apple with Brendan Hunt. He plays Coach Beard on Ted Lasso. She's the co-host of a podcast that was during the World Cup after the whistle with Brendan Hunt and Rebecca Lowe, and she hosts the NBC's Premier League coverage right now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the first thing I wanted to start with, what are the things about your job that are more difficult than people understand, that uh, the, the prep involved, uh, people who think you can uh, a broadcaster can just show up and, and be an expert about things without preparation? <laughs> you talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Guys, first of all, thank you for having me on. What an absolute pleasure it is to be on your lovely show. Um, ooh, I would say probably, and it would be the same with all sports broadcasters, and probably if you're a news broadcaster as well, is that you're never really off the clock. I mean, literally never, because the Premier League, I, I can't speak for NFL, NBA, but I would assume that it's pretty similar, is an ongoing soap opera of storylines. And if you miss out on a couple of days, you think, you know, I'll go take a couple of me days, a couple of spa days, I'll come back and read up on everything, you have missed about 25 storylines. So for me, I'm never off it. Whatever spare time I have when I'm by myself, I have a podcast on or a sports radio chat show on or something just to keep that ticking over because it never ends, guys, being in sport does ever. Is it joyous or is it obsessive, compulsive burden? You'd like to throw some of your devices in the sea because life will not slow down. I think on the whole, it's joyous. And on the whole, it's a habit. And it's a habit that I enjoy, so I'm okay with it. But there are times, and actually, usually, not this World Cup, because as you say, I was doing the podcast with uh, Brendan, but usually during a major tournament, because NBC don't have the rights, that is actually a time where I don't have to tune in to talk sport radio 24 7 so that's normally a time where i get a bit of a break and i can throw the phone down but um not this past world cup i was in it more than ever so it's kind of non-stop at the moment when you tune into sports radio i'm curious here what shows are you tuning into like who does well, rebecca Lowe like in sports radio okay well guys probably Can't nobody wait. you've ever heard of because it's all from across the pond on the whole you know there are not a huge amount of premier league chat shows in america did you think she was listening to uh Mike like and the Mad colin cowherd <laughs> like that, like, maybe she does like, wait, 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 i mean you uh, think she was tuning into american let her answer. Okay, nice. and by the way i will go across the pond and i will dominate england sports yeah. radio i mean oh, you will yes you will i'm thinking you about will, doing it there's nothing yeah. like you guys over there so <laughs> you, like they always talk about english people crying cracking america i feel like you guys could definitely crack england i know it's not quite as sexy as cracking america but i think you could do it uh, i basically listen to talk sport which is the only commercial can you believe this it shows how small england is it is the only commercial radio station solely based around sport uh in the whole country oh. and so it's nationwide so it covers all areas of the country all teams and obviously in england we don't have a ton of different sports i mean we do play cricket we do play a bit of rugby but on the whole we're football. So 90% of what's talked about on Talk Sport Radio is football because that's what happens in England. It's all about the footy. Your career choice and career path, did you have options once you are the daughter of BBC News presenter Chris Lowe? <laughs> like, how does that work? Like, is it chosen for you and what it is that you're witnessing growing up and you're just like, this is what I want to do. This is in my family blood. I want to be talking or I want to be presenting things to people. Nope, not at all, guys. You know, funnily enough, watching my dad read the news growing up, it never occurred to me in a million years that I could be on TV, would want to be on TV as a newsreader. It just, it was much more the other way. My mum was an actress. That's what I wanted to be. So that's what I trained to be. That's what I was going to be, or certainly going to attempt to be. Uh, that didn't happen because I ended up winning this competition at the BBC, but we didn't tell them who my dad was because in those days, reverse nepotism was a thing. I mean, nepotism is always a thing, but this was very much the BBC were very reverse nepotistic. So I did not want to tell them who my dad was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have let me win the competition. So that was all, all a big secret. You're, you're, until talking, the you're talking about the BBC's television talent search, right? Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. You, you won that. And how, how hard was it to win that? How many people are involved in that? I think it was about between 500 and 1,000. It wasn't loads. Um, but for me, who wasn't a trained journalist and really just loved football, soccer as a as a hobby and as a female in 2002 i was very rare with that so it was quite difficult to win it you had to go through a number of journalistic rounds where like write a match report send it in 
call a phone number, leave a match report on a voicemail after watching a football match, and then eventually getting to the final, which was at the headquarters of the BBC, seven people in the final. Um, and then it was a case of, again, some journalistic things, some things to the camera, interview some people on camera. And then they called and said, you won six month contract at the BBC. And I was like, oh, but I was going to be an actress. And I thought, yeah, you don't turn down the BBC. That's what you don't do in life. And so as a football presenter, that made your path, right? You win the contest, you do it for six months and you're like, okay, never mind. I'm not going to be an actress. This is, this is my path. I think it was more that once you're in the door of somewhere like that, it, it would be churlish and probably foolish to leave. It would be like winning a six month contract to ESPN when you really like NFL, for example, or straight out of college. And then after the six months, even if you don't think you're very good, leaving like you just leaving would be a big thing to do to leave an ESPN same thing with the BBC so I didn't think I was very good I found it very difficult I did not think that this was going to last very long but I also knew I could be an actress at any stage guys so let me see how far this craziness how much they want to employ me I mean really do they really want to employ a female in 2002 to talk football they did I stayed and the rest is history Woody why are you glowing Oh, the use of the word churlish. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one that I need to incorporate in my daily language. I love that word. Please do. Please You'd do. also have to be an idiot to leave ESPN. I think we can all agree with that. Yep. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm curious. And again, Wait, no, Re Re Rebecca, Rebecca once worked for ESPN. That's not about you. I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that, that wasn't about you. About that, that was yeah. self deprecation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That was about <laughs> us leaving ESPN. Oh, well, you. Uh, I want, well, you left too. I mean, you, you, you also you also left. I did. Uh, you left. She is the host of NBC's Premier League coverage, and I'm wondering if you, like me, believe that the greatest story of all that World Cup coverage that you were doing was not, in fact, the great ending and punctuation, but Salt Bay being on the field after that, oh, which uh, it truly God. enraged me in a way. I'm still enraged with the unearned yeah. fame of that guy grabbing and bothering Messi at his. <laughs> biggest moment in a silver Guys, suit it was sickening wasn't it <laughs> sickening and it drives me nuts but it all came around with some relationship he had with infantino at fifa and uh, you know there's just stuff that needs to be sorted out let's be honest all right at fifa we need to sort the place out and the friggin chef was yeah. the sort of encapsulation of everything that needs to be sorted out. You're being very gentle there. Come on. You can't. The strongest commentary you have on FIFA can't be we have to sort some things out. Nearly calling him the chef is a, is a great way to. Awesome. I mean, just the whole thing, though. All of it with FIFA. I, I, how is all of that allowed to be? Explain to me how in plain sight we can have the most corrupt thing in the, in the history of corruption at the height of corruption being more allowed than it is anywhere else. I work with Stu Gatz for the love of God. Well, I'm, thank you. I'm mortified by FIFA. How is that allowed to exist in its present state? Because not enough people are willing to pay the price to stand up and say no. And not, you know, when Qatar originally got the World Cup, guys, 12 years ago, people said no in print, they said no on telly, but nobody actually formulated a working group to push back against it. There aren't, there are the kind of, the people waving the flag saying, well, no, we are anti this, but no one's actually in in positions of power enough and enough of them to push back. So we had set Blatter and all the corruption that came with him. And now we seem to have moved on to G to Infantino. And it, it doesn't seem to have got a lot better. I mean, how about the selfies he was taking in front of Pele's coffin, by the way? Oh, no. I didn't even see that. Oh, you happens. don't want to look up that. Yeah. Don't look it up. Not Salt Bay, Gianni Infantino. Although if Salt <laughs> yeah, Bay were yeah, taking yeah. His selfies next to Pele's coffin, that would have been extraordinary. Pouring I salt. Salt Bay. Pouring <laughs> Holy shit! I what totally a, thought what that. A clarification. Yes. <laughs> Pouring salt on. Uh, <laughs> it is so universally enraging. I I, I don't. Uh, it it really was something to marvel at the idea that uh, the soccer would be that good at the end and that people would get f just forgetful as you, you that you'd have to consistently put aside your ethics here to understand that you're celebrating a profoundly corrupt uh, a profoundly corrupt entity uh, winning and I'm not even talking about Qatar I'm talking about FIFA I know I know. That I know, I know, and it and it's 
trust me, as somebody who works in this sport and who loves it dearly and wants to try to continue to spread the word in this country about it it's not bloody helping can i just tell you that it's not (laughs) helping they so to go back to what i said we need to sort it out but people with a lot more power than me need to step up and sort it out and push back and prevent infantino from continuing down the road that the previous members went down but isn't isn't the ultimate conundrum is that we won't stop watching like, I know. like we, they know we, it. We, we, we didn't. I, I watched the World Cup. We all watched the World Cup. People who love football watch the World Cup. Like they yeah. have they have that power over us, which is we love this thing. But I feel like that's sort of like governments. I mean, governments, none of us stop working. We all stop doing things. And governments are, you know, not always above board, are they? And yet here we are still doing everything in our country for our country. And I think that's just the case. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They have a precious commodity that we're all obsessed with and know that we will come back no matter what and ultimately that's what happened with Qatar because when it was announced everybody was like no 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 oh but the games are going to be great we've got to talk about football and Messi and it could be his last world cup and that's what happens football is intoxicating and it's kind of a problem what is the story behind your American citizenship Uh, (laughs) by the way I love how you just jump from subject to subject without even like any kind of segue (laughs) it's literally amazing Um, that's how we do it (laughs) transition uh, I just this is my it's my favorite Um, uh, the background to the citizenship is my little boy was born in America and it can get complicated number one if your child is born in America and you're not and I got nervous with all the different rumors people were telling me about things could happen so I'm like okay Uh, But secondly, also, you know, we've been here nearly 10 years, my husband and I, and it does feel like home. And we want to be able to vote. We want to be able to have our say on things. We're talking about, you know, not try to kind of make make good choices and contribute to this community and to this society. And and it's an important place. We're raising our child in a country that if we don't get to vote in it, it's harder, you know. So that was part of it. And we love the other thing is we love the country. We love of course, there's many things wrong with it. There's many things wrong with England. But we love the United States for so many reasons. And why not, if you can, become one? How far do you think you could throw an orange? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Great question. Oh, oh had to be asked. How really far? How, how many yards? If you had to put a... We're going to do this um, at the end of the show. Greg Cody and Stugatz yeah. are going to go and try and throw an orange, yeah. and they think they can okay. throw it uh, many yards. How many yards do you think is a reasonable guess on how are you, far you'd throw Are you one? counting where it lands or where it ends up stopping moving? No, it can roll. It can roll. The okay. end of the rolling okay. and everything. And definitely an orange, not a satsuma or a mandarin. I just want to get... Your standard orange, Cara or yes. Navel? Yes. No, yeah. I, I love all the follow-ups. Um, yeah. Yeah. Showing to yeah. the camera here. Okay. I've actually procured yeah. the oranges I can see it. Uh, okay, yeah. that we're going to be throwing okay. later. Well, if it was... I, I've got a decent arm. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell <laughs> you that I reckon I could throw it until it stops moving. Um... 50 yards. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So 50, I believe yeah, she could shoosh. throw 50 yeah. yards, but Jessica believes she could throw it 100 yards. She believes she could throw oh. it twice wow. as far as you. She thinks it's going to be fairly easy to throw it 100 yards. And I think you could throw it 100 yards too, or stones, Bless whatever you. British people say. I think say. rolling it might be, right. Stones. How many meters is that? Yeah. I think rolling it might be the better strategy if we're just going to go on roll. <laughs> no. Bowl, I bowl can roll it like 100 yards. Do like a bowling ball? <laughs> bowl it, bowl it up count. there. Yep. Uh, strange question. I apologize. Do you know who the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills is? Um, is it Josh Allen? Thank you very wow. much. And do you know the team in the NFL that every single year since the beginning of time has played on Thanksgiving Day? Is it? I don't know. No, I don't okay, know. one out of two is it's, fine. It, it yeah. Also unfair the way you asked the question. Why? Uh, well, because that it wasn't... Uh, if you'd ask her, do the Detroit Lions play on Thanksgiving every day, did you know that? That would be a fairer way to ask the question than to ask if she can name the team. Sure, I even knew the Detroit Lions was Thank an NFL you. team. Thank I you. thought it may it could well be maybe an NBA team, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. I'm not I'm just I'm not brilliant at my NFL teams, 
Some of them fine. Some of them like the Texans, and I'm just not good on. Basically, some of them. So the I'm ones glad that, you the ones that aren't on Sunday Night Football because you're not reading the promo for it. I was gonna say that's what I was gonna say. Cause I, I don't think I've ever read a Detroit Lions <laughs> tonight is. on Sunday that's Night the Football promo. <laughs> that's, that's the reason. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, and it, that is actually they why they have never that, been on that's Sunday correct. Night Football. That's why that and would the, happen. And the right. Premier League has been on NBC for ten years, and during that right. time. Uh, it, the, Detroit, the Detroit Lions had never been on Sunday Night Football. <laughs> the reason for the question, just so that you know, we were talking about in order for a media person to truly be expert on their subject matter, sometimes some of those experts have to be lopsided and can't pay attention to everything in other sports. That To be expert in one field, really expert, accomplished, makes it hard to be expert in a lot of other fields. Uh, without a doubt. And actually, that's why I find it so interesting in this country that there are people in my industry who are across. I mean, Mike Tirico, for one, can tell you so much about a bunch of sports. Bob Costas, of course, another. And I'm like, literally, I spend my entire life listening to Premier League and reading about Premier League. How on earth do you find the hours to spread that amongst all of these sports? But somehow they do. I'm just not built in that culture, our culture in England is pretty much one sport. So that's kind of all I can do. I'm basically a one trick pony, guys. Do you guys know if you're going to continue to do some version of After the Whistle with Brendan Hunt and Rebecca Lowe? Did you have enough fun that it's something that you might continue to do in some form, even though the World Cup games are over? We had loads of fun. In fact, I did call him on Friday. He said, give me a call. So I called him. Then he's got flu. So I'm waiting for him to call me back. I don't know is the answer to that, but I think that we had enough fun for there to be a future. Rebecca, uh, tomorrow, uh, the Premier League it has a massive game. Chelsea hosting Manchester City. Coverage will be on Peacock. Uh, right now, Manchester City are the, are the favorites to be uh, the, the Premier League title winners. Or are they still? Because Arsenal have had such a good season despite their nil-nil draw with Newcastle yesterday. Uh, how do you see the, the title race as it stands right now? If you'd asked me this yesterday morning, I'd have said Arsenal are now favourites. But just with that dropping of points yesterday, as you mentioned, against Newcastle and the way they dropped them in that Newcastle kind of bullied them a little bit, threw in a bunch of physical tackles and things that they were kind of disrupted their flow. It might end up being a blueprint for how to disrupt Arsenal's flow moving forward, which would really be music to the ears of Manchester City fans. I think whenever you have Erling Haaland in your team who has more goals at this stage of a season than anyone in the history of the Premier League, you are always going to stand a chance. So I think that City, on the whole, especially with their pedigree guys of four titles in the last five years, are still just about favourites. Rebecca, you mentioned earlier uh, soap opera storylines in international football. I wonder, do you think Ronaldo has buried his legacy under an avalanche of notorious cash by signing with an otherwise obscure Saudi Arabian club? Well, I just I just saw the headline. Did you see what he said when he was unveiled? He said how he hasn't he's got a lot still to offer here in South Africa. And I'm like, mate, what are you doing? Like, how can you get that so wrong? How can you go to Saudi Arabia? You gotta be and kidding me. South Africa. So number one, don't think the legacy is going to continue much in Saudi Arabia if he's calling it South Africa. <laughs> um, I do fear that his legacy has been tarnished with his behaviour internationally and at Manchester United. And it's a great shame because when you say Cristiano Ronaldo right now, to most people, you're thinking petulance, you're thinking attention-seeking, you're thinking financially greedy, you're thinking all the kind of negative things, whereas this guy was a magician, is still, to an extent, a magician and a genius, and one of the greatest players that's ever walked the earth. But his behaviour over the past two months has been so disappointing. I, I look at it now through the lens of, a mu of being a mum, and I show... Cristiano Ronaldo to my six-year-old boy who loves him, but I show him the behavior of storming off down the tunnel and, and just behaving the way he behaves and not being grace, graceful in defeat. And I don't want my son to look at that as an example. And so for me, mm -mm, he's out for me. Oh, wow. He is gone. Can you mm -hmm. explain to us here, uh, last item, I see that uh, Greg Berhalter had a very long statement, the U.S. coach, about uh, kicking his now wife 30 years ago in an argument they have that was being investigated uh, the statement was all about their relationship and how it was something that was, you know, teenage behavior from 30 years ago, but it's being investigated. And the, the statement is necessitated because not only is there an investigation, but he's clearly under it and wants to explain context. No, no, what, there was an attempt at blackmail. 
mm-hmm. which was mentioned in the in the statement. What That's do you right. Make, what do you make of this story? I, I, it kind of blew my mind when it broke yesterday, and because it came from Greg Berhalter's personal account, which isn't verified and has like a hundred followers or something, we it took a, a few minutes to work out whether or not it was legitimate. And then when U.S. Soccer retweeted or whatever they did and made their own statement we were like whoa my god i i, I could not believe the statement that detail in which he went in the sort of man doth protest too much kind of enough like too much mate too much um what goes on in his marriage you know he well he was 18 i mean he was a child not that that's any defense in any way shape or form and to kit anyway that whole situation is a mess the blackmail is Unfortunately, in this day and age, not particularly surprising in the middle of a World Cup, somebody wanted to take him down. What confuses me about everything is that his contract was up last week. So I don't really know what U.S. soccer has to do with Greg Berhalter anymore. They haven't renewed his contract and his contract expired at the end of December 2022. Can they not just wash their hands of him and move on? I don't really understand that side of it. The whole thing is a mess. It's a terrible look. They need to move on from it ASAP. She's the host of NBC's Premier League coverage, and we hope uh, there will be further forms of After the Whistle with Brendan Hunt and Rebecca Lowe. Thank you, Rebecca, for being on with us. Good talking to you. You guys are the best. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. uh, Dan Stugatz and uh, the bald head of Greg Cody are uh, in the window. (laughs) Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, Bald head? I mean, okay. The, the hair bar, on it. You the point that out, Ward. That's Jeez. a little it's harsh. A, it's a very spicy introduction. We, very thought, spicy. we thought that was a little harsh. The bald spot, excuse me. And Greg we've Cody. already begun, and that is Luke Thomas. He's joining us. He's the combat sports analyst for CBS Sports. Whittingham has been telling all our guests today. That's how he's been introducing them. Hey, this is Stu Gotts and Dan and the bald head yeah. of Greg Cody. What an honor for me. And Luke, let me say, you do not have a hair out of place, my friend. I mean, you look fantastic and a great beard. Yes, you my got well, you're, you're lucky. You caught me on a day I showered. I mean, and, that's really a big difference. Well, you look maker. clean. You look like you are resplendent with good hygiene. Your glasses are exceptional. But we're having you on because I believe you to be a uh, hugely credible MMA journalist and somebody who can navigate uh, the journalism elements of MMA in the way that it's covered that can be credible because I believe... Uh, Dana White gets a lot. He gets away with a lot, Luke, uh, in his power over that sport and his not caring about the journalists who cover that sport or journalism in general. And now he finds himself in a position where he got physical with his wife. His wife, uh, they were drinking. They were in San Lucas, and uh, she slapped him in the nightclub, and then he hit her twice. He apologized. He said it was booze, and no excuse, though, because his quotes from the past are there is this a quote the thing that you never bounce back from is putting your hands on a woman that was her dana white's words what are going to be the ramifications to dana white for the video of this being out there he's not going to get away with this with just an apology is he um hard to say but if i had to guess yeah i think he probably does um, not to say that's a good thing. In fact, it's pretty far from a good thing, but I'm going to bet that, um, he probably will have to do this, what he's already done, maybe some kind of small absence. And then that's really not a whole lot more to it. I mean, I just don't, there's a lot of factors at play here and it's hard to uh, get to all of them, but I think in general, one, there's not a lot of appetite within the MMA industry to heavily penalize Dana. Um, he is a powerful figure. He is a polarizing figure, even inside MMA. But he has, I mean, what do the fans call Dana, right? They call him Uncle Dana. He has this quite literally avuncular title that they uh, ascribe to him as sort of like, you know, the uh, this, this Santa Claus who just shows up and and is giving with all his time and his resources and everything else. And, and they like, he also is a true fight fan. And I think the other fight fans kind of identify that in him. So there's that portion the other portion is like this is a weird thing too right we all thought or at least we had some some belief that when mma entered the mainstream and it was on fox sports obviously before getting to espn but certainly by the espn days that this would be something of a civilizing force on top 
right? That this would be like obviously uh, ESPN is owned by Disney, and Disney's going to have its brand associated with UFC. This would have some kind of top down pressure to eliminate some of the more bad conduct or influences therein. And in fact, it's done exactly the opposite. It's almost as if ESPN and the other folks involved in MMA, it's the sponsors, not just the networks, are happy to take you know, the good parts of MMA and then or the traffic of it, if they're a website or whatever. And then when it comes to actually policing it in a responsible way to just be very hands off about it and act like nobody really cares. And there's just not, this, there just does not seem to be a general movement. And there never really has been in, in all my time covering the sport to really find a way to get bad actors to do better, to have some kind of force to compel them to act in some kind of manner that we would recognize as reasonable. There, it doesn't, there's no civilizing top-down force. And so as a consequence, people just mostly, for, in general, in general, you can get away with whatever the public will let you get away with. And given what the public is saying here, I suspect he survives this, yeah. Well, this is why I want to ask you follow-up questions, and I want to get into all of the layers of this one at a time because you say there are many. What does him being Santa Claus have to do with video of a very powerful Santa Claus slapping his wife? That's not... <laughs> Uh, that is not something that people in his position anywhere in sports can get away with with just an apology. Right. But here, here's the thing. It's like, what does it have to do with it? Uh, in the moral and ethical sense of it, uh, nothing. I mean, it's an abhorrent thing we all saw. In the brass tacks world of what are actually the levers that can be pulled to create change to force some kind of punishment or whatever the view is of what should happen here what are the actual levers you can pull getting the fans like for example i live in washington dc right it's not hard to get the fans to really put pressure on that organization to get dan snyder out now how effective that is i don't know but he's the most reviled man in town the fans do not support him at all it is the exact opposite on the other side. And so if you're making a choice about what to do about Dana White's future and you're in a position of power over him, the fact that the fan base isn't exactly rallying to get rid of him is a noteworthy thing. It doesn't. I'm not sitting here telling you that should be the determining factor, but they are going to look at that. They are going to weigh that. But I mean, look at this. Dana White in his own um, press release didn't even say this, but you're seeing a lot of people say this in his defense. Well, he he did, he wasn't struck first. I mean, Dana White himself didn't even say that, and yet they're rushing to his defense by noting this, which is a bad argument, but that it exists is, is quite understandable. And so you're asking what the relevance is. If you're making a choice at this stage to do something about Dana, you are doing it, I think, in large part against the overall wishes of the fan base. What kind of response you'll get to that, again, you, you can decide whether that's good or it's bad, but make no mistake, it's it's going to happen along those lines. I forget the second part of your question, but certainly that was the first. Okay, well, let's, uh, th I mean, Santa Claus slapping his wife is not something that anyone in his position in sports would get away with, with just oh, right. an apology. But beyond that, let's see, as you talk about changing abhorrent behavior and you charge, you talk about a bunch of people rushing in to say, well, Dana didn't hit her first. He's starting a slap league in a week. Yeah. He's expanding. And when you say changing behavior, the last I saw, Endeavor, the parent company, no comment. ESPN, the broadcast partner, no comment. UFC, no comment. Go to ESPN, according to Trent Rainsmith, and they direct you back to UFC for comment because ESPN says it does the dis distribution and UFC produces the content. Like, no, you're not going to get changed that way. You're going to be okay with a video of a very powerful man slapping his wife a couple of times. If it's no comment, no comment, no comment from all the powerful people who are in charge of policing this stuff. That's right. I think what they're trying to do, you did see the, the shares of Endeavor dip in value. If that were to continue, yeah, I do suspect something would actually happen. That would meaningfully change the equation to the power brokers, to the stakeholders here in a way that would actually force change. But dude, like, what are they trying to do? Now, I'm not in those meetings, so this is a guess. My guess is they're trying to wait it out. They're trying to wait it out. They're trying to wait out a situation where folks kind of realize, and by the way, TMZ, I mean, I'm sure you've discussed this on your show, what a hookup they provided. I mean, again, I'm going to guess here, but this is my guess. They had the footage that, that of Dana hitting his wife or exchanging shots, whatever anyone wants to say at this point. And they went to him pretty clearly, and they got a whole PR strategy ready to go when everything was re released basically simultaneously. That has done him 
a lot of favor. Again, probably shouldn't have, but that they acted in that way and it actually benefited them. I think it will. So to, to, to answer the, so the broader question, like Endeavor silence, ESPN silence, all of this, they are very much banking on the fact, or the hope anyway, that this will largely go away because most scandals about fighters and in the fight world, by and large, unless they're like really juicy and salacious, which this kind of gets to that in some ways, uh, they just ignore it. They There is so much bad acting, or I should say so much bad behavior that goes on. Un- I mean, let me make a point to you, Dan. The Kyrie Irving situation, right, where he shares this link to this Amazon video that has all this anti-Semitic nonsense in it. If that happened in MMA, it would have never been a story. Never. Not not at all. There's no one seems to care in the space. And And I'm not saying that I don't care. Like for 15 years, I've been banging the drum on stuff like this. No one ever seems to be bothered by these kinds of things, by incredibly poor attitudes towards women, incredibly poor attitudes towards minorities or any other group that's um, got the bullseye on them at the stage of of America's development, whatever you name, it would never have been a story. And it was nonstop in the NBA because, because there are these other forces, the the network itself acting in a way that it wanted to in that case, or sponsors, or obviously in Brooklyn, there's a very strong Jewish community or whatever. There were all these forces that came down on them and made change possible that mechanism doesn't really exist in mma and now you're wondering like why isn't this happening it's happening because that reflex doesn't exist in this part of the world at least not very much so the only hope we have for you know wanting him to do the right thing say the right things act the right way are the shareholders of endeavor they could speak right they could speak very very loudly and that's about it probably Probably. Again, it's, this is a fluid situation. Maybe tomorrow it blows up and people decide differently. But based on what I'm seeing now, I just don't see enough public outcry either within or even frankly outside of the MMA industry. Short of them really f- messing with the money, I, I, what is the, again, what is the mechanism? What's the lever you're going to pull that's going to force the change? So I simply don't know what it is. So you're basically saying that MMA is in the wonderful position that everyone in sports would want to be in, which is we get all the good stuff from being a big major sport that is serious and credible, and when there are consequences to be had, no, we don't have to deal with any of the stuff that all the other leagues have to deal with that are our kind of sizable and credible. That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, and and there's there's some complicated reasons for it. Here's one that you may not have considered. Years ago, about 10 years, I have to look at the math exactly, so double check this. The UFC instituted something called the Code of Conduct, which was for their fighters. This came about when a transgender fighter had begun competing on, not in the UFC, but in, you know, regional MMA. And a lot of the fighters came out and had, you know, it's less than progressive things to say about it, something along those lines. And so they instituted this code of conduct, and it wasn't just about things you could say like that in the media, but about other ways of conducting yourself. And it had a long uh, you know, series of bylaws therein. And they used to find people about it. Nate Diaz got in trouble one time for a homophobic slur about 10 years ago. They fined him a very modest amount, and then they sort of cited the code of conduct. The code of conduct has all but vanished. It still exists on the books. They tend to add stuff to it, especially around this betting scandal around James Krause, which you may or may not know about. Well, this but, thing, well, uh, this is a whole other thing. Like, yeah. so this gambling scandal where where Dana White just says, "Well, we got rid of him. Nobody can deal with him at all anymore, and that solves our problem." Like, that's a pretty substantive problem for integrity to have at the center of your sport. Yeah, it's it's very much not great. It's a massive problem, and there are investigations ongoing, but again, here's the detail, right? What's the difference? The difference is there is top-down pressure because you now have federal, I think, law enforcement agencies looking into this, right? They're not leaving it to the whims or the existing infrastructure to battle these kinds of things within MMA. There's actually a top-down force that's happening here. So that would be, to me, a pretty major distinction about why you're getting change in one direction and why you're not getting change in another direction. I think, you correct me if I'm wrong here, Luke, and you can catch his work, CBS Showtime, Morning Combat, and Combat Sports Analyst in general for CBS Sports. What do you think should happen here? If if just the right thing were happening, the right moral thing, what is it? I mean, bare minimum lengthy suspension. Bare minimum. Bare minimum, bare minimum, bare minimum. Uh... You could make a case for dismissal. I know some folks have. I, you know, 
I, I don't I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is with that one, candidly. And I'm not here to say that I've got the, all of the moral clarity involved to to do that. I wouldn't begrudge someone who said that dismissal was the right call. Like if that's something that someone believes that, that I, I wouldn't really argue with it. Um, it's just such a it's such a moment in time where, you know, we, we, we have been highlighting so many issues within the community. And by the way, like, I don't even know if you saw this. I mean, my God, what, what a start to 2023 for MMA. There was uh, some reporting last night out of Mexico that a former UFC fighter had uh, been arrested for allegedly, I'm going to use this word allegedly because it's the state we're in here, um, murdering. He, he hasn't been in the UFC for some time, a long time ago, I think 2009 or so, maybe even earlier than that. But um, he was arrested for allegedly murdering his girlfriend. I mean, the amount of attitudes in MMA or in combat sports more generally, actually, because we should talk about Javante Davis in boxing, too. Like, there's a, there's a case to be made there as well. But um, just the, the amount of, like, really backwards attitudes towards women in the sport is it is it, the, the buy in is everywhere at every level you begin to see it. And so like, how do you combat a problem? Like you can get rid of Dana White and that's fine. Like I, I, he, he made his bed and he'll have to lie in it if that's the decision that comes down from Endeavor at some point. But on the other side, like there's a much bigger conversation to be had here about why are there so many very toxic attitudes towards women at every virtual, virtually I should say, every level of the sport, especially the sport where relative to boxing, the women play a much more significant and important role as competitors. That by itself doesn't mean that they, you know, human rights are what they are and ethics apply equally across the board. But it was sort of pointing out like how unusual it is given how the 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 the, the sport operates. Anyway, I'm sort of meandering here, but just to sort of point out like. I definitely think bare minimum lengthy suspension. If they got rid of them, I, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to it. But more to the point, there's just a bigger conversation here about are we really going to let combat sports just be left to their own designs where these kinds of things happen? Or on another side, fighters are flying over to Chechnya to take money from Ramzan Kadyrov on camera. I mean, it's just endless in the sense of just not having any clear moral compass about things. To me, I'm 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 more concerned about the broader picture uh, going forward. I think you have the history here to know that basically as a business combat sports have been a sewer as a business i don't think i'm saying anything that anybody doesn't know in combat sports for disney to be overseeing that and for disney to say hey this video go talk to ufc we have no comment your mm -hmm. thoughts there given that they're a broadcast partner given that they're a journalistic arm your thoughts there are what? I mean, am I allowed to curse on this show? I don't know if I am. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, dude, that's just chicken shit, right? <laughs> like, that's just chicken shit. That That is indefensible. It's totally indefensible. Um, and again, one more time, oh, like everyone thinks UFC and ESPN are going to be aligned together. This means that there's going to be greater scrutiny on UFC. It is the exact opposite. Is the exact opposite. They've been enabled, if anything, right? If anything has happened, they have been enabled. You simply cannot. There's there's good journalists who do good work there. To be very clear, Mark Ramundi is one of them. I have I've worked work with Mark and Ariel Hawani at the same time. Brett Okamoto, another guy I like very much. But in general, about whoever's making decisions over there, it's chicken shit. It's the most chicken shit thing I've ever seen in my life. Maybe in terms of like high level people in this industry being called to account. I mean, the amount of attention that gets put on other actors who engage in malfeasance who have much less a relevant role in the sport is vastly outstripping whatever you're seeing for Dana White's coverage. It is, I mean, listen, they're just showing you their cards, right? This is who we are. This is who we are. We're in this for the clicks when the times are good. We're in this for you to look the other way when the times are bad. And, um, which is weird because they don't do that for a lot of the other sports, you know, Pablo Torre and everybody else has been, and Mina Kimes, they do a really great job of trying to shine the light where it deserves to be shined, no matter the actor, no matter the space. But again, when it comes to this side of the story, People just seem to lose interest in the wider public in terms of like the non-fight fans. And then the fight fans get their back up and say, nah, it's not a big deal. Move on. It's okay. And so we reach an impasse like this and it's, uh, it's fucking gross. Are your words as strong when I ask you endeavor saying no comment? Uh, yeah. I mean, I just don't, I don't owe endeavor anything other than the truth. Uh, yeah, it's cowardly. I mean, I mean, how, I just, you how, how do you not say something, especially when you have a lead time? Right. Like, again, TMZ kind of clearly, in my view, in my in my opinion, uh, gave Dana the heads up. This was coming like they knew this was coming. They had something to have to say about this and they haven't done anything. It just tells you what they think of the audience. 
right? Tells you what they think. Of they, they think that like, yeah, they don't care. So why should we care? I mean, that seems to be the best assessment that I can make. He does excellent work about combat sports and has done so for a long time for CBS Sports and now Showtime. Morning Combat is the name of the podcast. Thank you, Luke, for the expertise. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate your time. Likewise. Thank you, Luke. Have a good one, sir. Thank you. Thanks, yep. Luke. Take care. Dan, I have breaking news. Don't go anywhere. I have breaking news. According to Adam Schefter, the Dolphins, who are preparing to be without Tua and Teddy Bridgewater, uh, dealing with a dislocated uh, pinky. Actually, hold on, Stu, Stu before you do that, sorry. You, 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 can, you, can, you can do it again. Are you good, right? Yeah. Sorry. Right, we, we didn't get all that. All right. Go for it. Uh, Dan, stay right there. I have breaking news. According to Adam Schefter. Stay right here. Stay, do, do not, you, I saw you. You were going to get up. You Stumble were about to down. leave. Stay right move. here. Uh, I, have to go, I have to it's go to the it. bathroom. No, this is worth it. Okay? You think we get bathroom breaks? I haven't no taken a bathroom breaks. break in two years. I mean, <laughs> it's an Adam Schefter report on the Dolphins. I think you'd be interested. Okay? Uh, I am interested, but stay, stay right there. Stay Don't right move. here. Don't leave, stop Dan. Moving. Okay. Don't stop moving. Don't move. Okay? The Dolphins, who are preparing to be without Tua this weekend, and Teddy Bridgewater, because he's dealing with a dislocated pinky, the Dolphins have signed your guide, Dan. Veteran quarterback Mike Lennon. <laughs> wow. You, you, stay right yeah, there. You didn't need to no tell move, me to stay not right move. here for that. Uh, I need to be put it on the poll, please, Roy, at Levitard Show. Which should have been allowed to happen first? Dan going to the bathroom or Stu Gatz's emergency breaking news on Mike Glenn. Why do I care that Mike Glennon is coming in at the end because they don't trust third third quarterback Skylar Thompson? It's an upgrade, is it not? I mean, big game. Big game, Glennon. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I threw a wiffle ball one time. Try to throw it some cut. Almost threw my arm with it. I was like, oh, shit. You're a young person. I have a wiffle ball, Dan. They'll get you, no matter what age. It's true. Tony Think you're Verlander all of a sudden, and you throw a curveball, and that ball's like, and then your arm just. They're going to do this. Greg Cody and Stugatz are going to do this in the post game, and Greg Cody is already trying to weasel out of his claim that he could throw a football 40 yards. He saw football procured and got scared immediately because his boasts are going to unravel in video, as are Stugatz's. They're both worried about getting injured trying to throw an orange. Yep. Jessica has required a personal masseuse before she takes on this I'm endeavor. I'm getting off of IR, Dan. I I thought I, I had surgery last month and shingles. What? If Same you, spot if on you, my back. If you walk in here, shingles. if you walk in here and say, I can throw an orange 100 yards, go throw an orange 100 yards. I didn't say I'm going to do it after today's show. I said I can do it. Sur surgery and shingles. What's going on? I feel like we should express a concern on that. <laughs> oh, but don't worry. I ju let's just make fun of her because she doesn't want to throw an orange today. Thanks for your concern. What Chris. surgery did you have? I'm not giving you my HIPAA. Okay, but the, you did. You did. You did volunteer. You did volunteer shingles, and there's some confusion and controversy about how how problematic the shingles were. Whittingham really mansplained to you that it didn't bother you as much as you thought it did. Correct. Uh, I they're her shingles. I, I, they're I not was yours. reporting the yeah. information that Jessica gave to me, which is I'm fine. And you know, by the way, when you're young, shingles is caused by an onset of stress. So I think from now on, I'm going to name my shingle Chris Whittingham. You know what? I I have rickets. I'm going to be out there throwing an orange anyway, despite rickets. Right. So you what is rickets? What the fuck is rickets, Greg? Uh, rickets. Yeah, I'm a little low on vitamin D, but I don't like to get into my <laughs> I have a vitamin business. D pill, Greg, if you want one. Hey, I'll take it. Believe me. D in it. <laughs> I have rickets. Hey, hey yo. <laughs> DNA is. <laughs> Would you expect him to have anything else? <laughs> Rickets. I think shingles are stress related always, no matter your age. I thought they were always stress related. I'm glad that everyone in this room, Amin Al Hassan, has opinions on what shingles is. But it wasn't on your arm, though, Jess. You can throw an orange. It was on my back. But that has nothing to do with your arm. Oh, my God. <sighs> She's not doing this today, but we will put it in the file. Maybe along... I'll do it. Maybe I'll do a, pr a practice throw today, though. 
Um, but it won't count. We will put it on the try it. file <laughs> with uh, with Mike Ryan has to eat some toilet paper and all the things Billy Gill has said we have to get together and talk about at a later date. I will say this. When I said I could throw an orange, I'm not throwing a football. I can't throw it further than 20 yards. I said I could throw an orange 50 yards. We're doing it on the beach. I don't like the surface. I don't like it either. Yeah, you're me putting neither. me on the like clay courts. Put me on the hard court. I need yes. some. I need some concrete. Clay court. Court. And you got Bave. sea breeze coming in too. Pave yeah. the beach. Mm-hmm. My shingles relapsed. By the way, listening to all of you, oh, God. double down on your fake concern over my shingles. By the way, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Amin, what do you have for us that is nice very cloak. strongly opinionated? Well, while we're kind of going over all the things that people owe, bets owed, and all that stuff, I believe a, a young Chris Whittingham has to do a show from a bathtub. We're not there yet. <laughs> Gino Smith has not finished the season. We don't know what his final statistics will be, but What's we, the we're, bet? Not, we're not there yet. I mean, what is the bet? I don't remember the specifics of the bet between you, Whittingham, and uh, and Gino Smith. Well, I said that Gino Smith was going to throw for 3,000 yards and 30 touchdowns. And, uh, you said four thousand. I believe he's oh, at thirty nine eighty seven. Right okay. Now. All right. Well, well, when he gets his thirteen yards, then <laughs> we'll be fine. Yeah. Is I mean, he he's, going he's, to lose the bet? He's going to lose the bet. Absolutely going to get crushed here, and he's got to do a show from his bathtub as a result. Well, Mike Ryan needs toilet paper. It seems delightful, actually. I want to say from something the bathtub. too. It does. We were talking earlier about people that are super expertise and super focused on one thing. Like Zach Lowe can't name Josh Allen as the quarterback. You know what I want to say? Like you Amin, with my shingles. But Amino go on. Hassan knows shit. This guy knows stuff. Okay. Not only is he an expert in basketball, an expert in movies, the guy knows football, the guy knows, you know, a little handful of baseball. This guy, you know what? This guy gets it. Yeah. A little bit of everything. Yeah. A couple of things I want to get to because Tony knows stuff too. <laughs> in the middle of that MMA interview, just tossed aside is the idea that MMA champions are visiting a warlord to shoot off rockets and stuff. Just off to the side of the other stuff we were talking about. Tony, what are the specifics there that people need to know? Yeah, so there's a Chechen warlord whose name, I'm going to probably butcher, Ramzan Kadryov, and and Luke Thomas, you know, actually mentioned it for like a brief second, which is like kind of a big deal. I want to read from a New York Times really quick just to name you some of the names that are here. Uh, Former UFC flyweight champion Kamaru Usman, uh, former flyweight champion Henry Cejudo, and former interim lightweight champion Justin Gaethje were pictured pictured in November testing out grenade launchers and assault rifles at the Russian Special Forces University in Chechnya, facility used to train Russia's Special Force, uh, Forces units, including those participating in the war in Ukraine. Uh, Kamar Usman's been there three times since 2020. Uh, not only that, Kadyrov also bankrolls. Uh, his name is Magomed Ankalaev, who was the lightweight title uh competitor in this past uh 282's lightweight title fight and basically everything gets said you know nothing gets said about what's happening there it is strange to gots to see that sport become such a mainstream thing while not being covered the way mainstream things are covered and i would say in many instances it's dangerous like somebody needs to be in charge and it probably can't be the guy whose moral level who's in charge is slapping <laughs> his wife in a nightclub like he can't be the one making all the rules for everybody because he makes so much money in the barbaric games that everyone's cashing in and no one's governing it but aren't aren't they just leaning into the their lack of ethics or like this this is dirty we are dirty we are going to be dirty, and this is who we are as an entity. To make a clarification, UFC has no business whatsoever with Kadyrov. He's they've banned him. They've made substantive but they, moves but, but they, to make sure that he's not part of his fighter. They don't mind the fighters that are there, or they don't like suspend them for for doing any of this stuff. Again, I will say to you that people need to, if it's going to be a Disney product that is uh, making Endeavor a lot of money, and everyone is making millions of dollars, it can't come replete with one of the coaches is gambling. Gambling and the the champions are going to visit the, the warlord and the 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 face of the 
place is getting away with, yeah, I slapped my wife in public a couple of times in video, and what are you going to do about it? I'm just going to apologize, and then all the companies that I make money for are going to run away scared with no comment. Like, if we're going to cover it like a major sport... Cover it like wanted. a cover it like a major sport. Like, but I'm telling you, you say it's what he's wanted, but Dana White also doesn't want journalism. He ran Helwani out of there. Like the stories are horrible. Helwani's just doing journalism. He's got no use for journalism. Why would he have use for journalism? Why would he? Because that's what makes your sport mainstream, right? And that's what he's always. He doesn't need it. It's mainstream now without journalism. He's Is got. It, it's not. It's not I mean, we, we have we have. It's the not debate. football, baseball, basketball. Yeah, we have the shows on here on on television. I Man, mean, it's, it, a it, global, it's, it's, guys, it's a big it's sport. A global, it's a big sport, no, guys. It's a big guys, sport. It's a global sport. It's a giant sport. Like, don't tell don't tell me just because you guys don't care about it. It's a giant sport. Yes, I agree. I mean, but even, like, is it the number one sport in any country? Like yes. I, yes. I mean, yeah, there are. Yes. Like, it, in Ch there's 800 Chechnyan fighters now, right? Like. You know, Khabib Nurmagomedov, all these guys like from Russia. That's one of the major sports in Russia is mixed martial arts, is is MMA. And another thing too, one of the new faces of the sport, Hamza Chimaev, who's this absolute just monster who's tearing everybody apart, has extensive ties to Kadyrov, right? So now we're looking at not only the the ancillary fighters that have ties, but now we're talking about guys that are, could be the faces of the sport in the next three years. I want to talk about a couple of other things here and see if we have time for Stu Gatz's weekend observations. I Some of the uh, fresh reporting around DeMar Hamlin's story, his uncle Dorian, Greg, uh, Dorian Glenn has been talking to people and saying there has been improvement on his nephew. He's on a ventilator, but he's improved to a 50% oxygen uh, needed after being at 100% of oxygen needed. He's still sedate, sedated, but... Uh, the focus is on uh, recovering the breathing and the healing of the lungs. And I don't have new information reported on uh, what the lack of oxygen to the brain for that period of time has caused. But we will give you, uh, we don't want to get too far away from that story and get too forgetful about that story with uh, without giving you new information as it presents itself. Uh, in a more silly vein, uh, Stugat. Even though Skip Bayless, who was a journalist once and now, you know, does circus tricks at <laughs> 70 uh, for, what are you laughing about? Just because you're right. I mean, Skip Bayless was a journalist once. And, oh, uh, but he's evolved now. better than most of them because he has figured out how to get to the clicks. He makes good television. He has kept himself relevant i just saw a packers defensive back saying of shannon sharp and skip bayless hey i'm a great corner don't tell me i'm just a good corner but i want to play for you some sound here because skip bayless is in it right now and as is skip bayless's want he does not back down and i will get to the tweet in a second and read to you the controversy that surrounds skip bayless but in paraphrasing it i will just tell you that what he said was at a time that the country was watching Monday Night Football and scared and horrified, Skip Bayless dared to wonder first and quickly about the logistics of the game. How do you, can how do you cancel this game? This is an important game. And this bothered Shannon Sharp enough. The tweet and stuff around it and what he saw on television Monday night that he did not come into work the next day, and it would appear that he did not come into work, at least in part, because of Skip's tweet. But he came in today. And I don't believe this is contrived television, Stugatz. I believe that Shannon Sharp are now, because of what argument television can do to relationships, because of the complicated nature of television relationships, I believe Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless are in a broken place and that their histrionics on air are not something that is disappearing off air. And I believe it because of how the show began today. I don't believe Shannon Sharp is contrived here. He didn't want to come in on a day that was about DeMar Hamlin and have to talk about Skip Bayless's tweet or the making of television, making of controversy, the devil's work of I'm going to be over here in a dirty alley of debate television masturbating into a tin can to get my clicks. 
like the, the, the dirty work of that that's being done with just grossness in my field is the evolution of we just got to get people to watch. And it doesn't matter what we have to do in order to get them to watch. Listen to what happens here when Shannon Sharp tries to start their show today by explaining why it is he wasn't on yesterday. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation of why I wasn't on air yesterday, and I won't get into speculation or conjecture or innuendo, but I will say this. In watching that game on Monday night, uh, what happened to DeMar Hamlin struck me a little different. Um, as a brotherhood in the NFL, when injuries happen, when we know injuries are a part of the game, I've seen guys suffer ACLs and Achilles tear, but I've never seen anybody have to be revived and fight for their life on the field. So it struck me a little differently because I remember seeing my brother paralyzed on the field temporarily, and he was able to regain focus. Um, Skip tweeted something, and although I disagree with the tweet, uh, and, and uh, hopefully uh, Skip would take it down, but I didn't want it. Well, yes. time out, time out. I'm not going to take it down because okay. I stand by okay. what I tweeted. Skip, let me okay. finish. Let me, All right, okay. Go ahead. No, you go. Go ahead, let's go, Jen. Okay. I mean, I cannot even get through a monologue without you interrupting okay. me. Well, you could have came back. Skip, well, I thought, Skip, just let me. I, I didn't I, know I, you were going to bring no, up No, this. I was just going to say, Skip, I didn't want to yesterday to get into a situation where DeMar Hamlin was the issue. We should have been talking about him and not get into okay. your not get into your t uh, uh, your tweet. That's what I was going to do. But you can't even let me finish my opening monologue without you interrupting. Okay. I was under the impression you weren't going to bring this up because nobody here had a problem with no, that tweet. No. Clearly, the bosses wanted you to offer explanation. So clearly, somebody no, they did not have the, nobody. Let's go, Jay. Credit to Skip Bayless for following the number one rule of journalists, which is always make yourself the story. <laughs> in the need to be first, in the need to get out there with an opinion instantaneously, he wrote. No doubt, the NFL is considering postponing the rest of this game, but how? This late in the season, a game of this magnitude is crucial to the regular season outcome which suddenly seems so irrelevant. I would say that by the standards of tweeting, that is pretty benign. However, given what was happening in Read the Room, nobody needed to hear it right then. And that's what's being objected to. He won't delete it. The bosses don't have a problem with it because by itself, without any Read the Room, by itself, the tweet, you're like, you shrug your shoulders. It's word salad. Like, it means nothing. He's, he just... Tweeted like two things that are kind of contradictory at the same time just to have a take. And it, it is funny because he's definitely said and done things that are way worse on its surface. But it's the history of all of that is what you read when you see the tweet, right? Like people are ready to come after him because of all the shitty things that he's done in the past. But I agree with you like this. Th that, those sentences are kind of just word salad. It. You're, ask, you're asking Skip Bayless, sorry, Greg, to read a room, which is funny because he's incapable of reading any sort of room. You're asking Skip Bayless not to make it all about himself, and it was a benign tweet, but you do have to read the room and recognize, while people are probably thinking what Skip actually tweeted, no one's going to tweet it out, and Skip Bayless, with a massive platform, was dumb enough to tweet it out. Well, it's the timing of it, for sure, and two days later, I think it's okay to admit, look, Despite this tragedy, there is a pragmatic element to this where at league headquarters in the NFL in New York right now, they're debating, do we need to replay this yeah, but, game? But what difference does it make? Like we can, what I would say to you in both instances, okay, in both people who are now rushing to say, and there are many of them, hey, Dana White's, Dana White's wife hit him first. My question in both these instances with this stupid tweet and this is, what are you arguing on behalf of? Like, who, who's, what side are you on here that everyone's mourning? Hey, the logistics of an NFL game. We just, we possibly saw someone die on a field. Let me, like, what are you arguing on behalf of? My right, he's not taking it down. His co-worker, Shannon Sharp, is angry and has asked and didn't show up for work, has asked him to take it down. His co-worker, who had a brother who was paralyzed, like, what are you arguing on behalf of? I, no, my right to speak to logistics freely? NFL logistics are what I have to talk about as as somebody's on a ventilator and being turned from their back to their to their stomach so they can breathe better. Like, what are you arguing on behalf I, I, of? I don't think it's an argument at all. I think the 100% priority is this young man's health and future. 
I also think it can be both things. I also think this was a very important game in terms of the playoffs, which are an important thing to the NFL. And to not replay this game uh, is a big deal. And it's important to to mention that as you think you're getting cardiac arrest administered no, on a field. Like, I never like, would have tweeted. No, no, but, what, but I'm saying you're saying it now two days later, and you still think it's important to say. And I'm asking again. I'm Okay. The, the freedom of Skip Bayless to have the take that gets the clicks in the middle of America thinking they just saw a young man die on television. Yeah. Like, what are you arguing on behalf of that? Yes, it's an important game. Okay. Yeah, agreed. Now what? I never would have tweeted what he tweeted when he tweeted it. But there is secondarily. But you're going to keep doing it. You're going to. You're, you're well, Dan, Dan, okay, Dan, hold fine. on a second. It's in defense of Greg, Dan, don't act like people weren't thinking about that selfishly, uh, uh, weren't no, thinking but, about so what happens to the rest uh, of the uh, NFL okay. season. And my question, why do you think Skip Bayless right now is in the mess that he's in, where his bosses are like, well, you don't need to take that down, but he's because, got a problem with his coworker Because it's insensitive, the time that he tweeted yes. it, to be thinking about anything else. But, but people but, were thinking uh, about okay, it. And my, okay, and? Okay, and? What do you mean, end? People were thinking about okay, it. I'm so, saying so Skip Bayless was not alone in thinking about so it. So think it, okay? And but you, he was it. dumb enough to tweet it out. So think it, but don't don't say it. Uh, well, no, there's timing. Timing is involved, and that was poor timing and poor taste by Skip Bayless. There's no question about it. You can think about it a couple of days later, but everyone's focus at that point in time should have been the health of that player because that's something we've never seen in all the years of all of us watching the NFL. Players haven't seen it. Players haven't witnessed it. No one knows how to react in that spot, including professional broadcasters who didn't know what to say and didn't know what to do. It was bad timing. It was poor taste. But he was not alone, and that's all I'm saying in thinking that aloud. Like he was not alone, Dan. I'm there not. Were, I'm not saying he just guys, has a blue check mark and a gazillion followers. Guys, I'm, I'm certain other people on, I'm, on Twitter were tweeting the I'm, same I'm, thing. I'm not saying that he's alone on this. Sure, everybody was thinking about what the NFL was going to do after this week, but at that time, maybe you should keep your thoughts to yourself. We all agree. Like we, uh, he, I no, think Greg's saying he, no, he even he, agrees. He doesn't, and his boss doesn't. Like no, that's just the. I'm saying I'm not expecting Skip Bayless to agree. I'm expecting him to st to stay entrenched, and I'm not certain if Skip Bayless has any bosses over there. The like that place the, seems the, to be running by itself. The place that I am telling you to examine here is you are looking at possibly the breakup of a television relationship that has been very successful and very fruitful over Shannon Sharp's not going to keep taking this. For, in the name of television, that you got to say the thing every time, even though your brother was paralyzed on a field and I didn't come into work and I need a minute to discuss this on air and you're going to interrupt again because you always need to be able to say things. It's how you become the monster that you are. You always have to defend no matter what's happening in the room. I get to say the thing. Shannon Sharp made the decision to partner with an insensitive asshole. Okay, Shannon Sharp knows he exactly what's that. coming. He doesn't think oh, that. Dan, how does he he's not never know what's thought that? He's never thought that. He likes Skip Bayless. He speaks publicly, very glowingly about what Skip Bayless is in private. They are making a contrivance on television, and this is the result of what happens when television egos and emotions get involved. And Skip Bayless is finding himself in a position where Shannon Sharp is losing respect for him. But no, but that's what Stugatz is saying. Stugatz is saying Shannon Sharp participates in the contrivance. Yes, he's the foil for the contrivance. Yeah. Yep. And now he thinks he's Skip Bayless is equal, and he's asking Skip Bayless to understand what he's saying, and he couldn't get through the monologue before Skip Bayless took his show back. Can because you... Skip Bayless is all about Skip Bayless. I mean... <laughs> right, he's asking Skip Bayless to be a human being right. when he proves over and over again with the 1,000th criticism of LeBron James, balloons fell from the ceiling when he did that. He has no interest in being a human being. And Shannon's all in on whatever it is they're doing because it's been successful for both of them, but this is one that crossed the line for Shannon. Skip finally reached the place where Shannon's like, no, I'm not in on this anymore. And so we'll see what happens with their relationship. But Shannon knows what he signed up for when he agreed to be Skip Bayless' no, partner. Get think, out of no, here. No, I think you say that without understanding the cumulative effect of he didn't come into work yesterday, man. I know. I know. Like, that's not... 
But Dan, I don't know how impacted. I don't know if it's because of Skip's tweet. Like I don't know. And listen, it doesn't matter. Like he saw something. His brother went through something. He didn't want to talk about it. He also says he didn't want to talk about Skip's tweet. Uh, it's understandable. You know, we do uh, for God bless football something with Austin Eckler uh, every week. He didn't feel like talking yesterday. He didn't want to talk. He might not want to talk this week. I'm good with that. Like, that could be the reason Shannon didn't want to come in. I mentioned earlier, Keyshawn didn't come into his show yesterday, but he was just, in today. He just said in the sound that you heard that the tweet was part of it. That Part of it. Yeah. He didn't want to discuss uh, Skip's tweet. It wasn't a day to discuss that. But he was also clearly impacted and affected in a in a in a way that he's never been impacted and affected before to not come in on a Monday you or tell, Tuesday. You tell me if a man who hasn't come into work and has asked you to delete a tweet, you're saying he knew what he was getting into. I'm like, did he? Because if he had if if he had foreseen that, he wouldn't be sitting out a day and he wouldn't be asking someone to delete a tweet if he knew what it is that he was signing up for. My guess is, and what we just heard is that Shannon Sharp over that man. That's a long relationship to be arguing on television with somebody. Yeah. Some of it's real, some of it's fake, but people get mad at each other all the time. And Shannon Sharp has actually like there's there's got to be a piece of this that's offensive to Shannon Sharp. He's much more accomplished as what he did for a living than what Skip Bayless does. Like, no doubt. Like, there's more talent involved in how hard it was for Shannon Sharp to, to become a Hall of Famer. And you're having your, you, you need your opinion to be elevated by the clown show that's next to you. I'm saying when Shannon originally agreed to do that show, he was well aware of who he was signing up to do the show with. And yesterday, finally, Skip Bayless arrived at a line that crossed the line. For Shannon Sharp. And so maybe he doesn't want to be with him anymore, but he clearly knew. There's no way he didn't know what he was signing up for. Skip Bayless is going to make everything about Skip Bayless. Every single, the worst possible story. How do I know? He just did it, Dan. You, you say this, to guys, but I would say to you that everyone who works with Skip Bayless says what a treasure he is to work with behind the scenes. And I don't think that you necessarily know just because you're making television where... The journalist stops and the actor begins with somebody who's so desperate to stay relevant and has done it successfully at 70 that all he does is exercise, eat the same meals every day, and think of the things that he can say on television that will get, a tel uh, get attention. Skip Bayless is a particular kind of creature that has been birthed by journalists being given television platforms and ego and voice. And at 70, it's ride an exercise bicycle, eat broccoli, and how can I say the thing that gets people offended so I can do this 100 years from now, eating broccoli and chasing LeBron James on a dialysis machine and a walker <laughs> through, a, through a nursing home because I figured out how to, how to live to 150 <laughs> on broccoli and hatred. <laughs> we are welcoming genuine greatness to the show, American Championship Medal. You can see Carly tonight on Fox's new reality endurance competition show, Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if Special Forces means like military, mm -hmm. uh, like Green Beret. Yes. Yeah. These crazy people. I'm not talking about soccer players. I'm talking about, I am fascinated, Carly, by the same people you're fascinated by, which is how do they endure what they endure. So thank you for joining us. And uh, before we get to uh, how decorated you are as an American champion, tell us the worst stuff they put you through on this show because I can't imagine what would, even as a competition-aholic, I can't imagine what would make you do this stuff. These people are terrifying. <laughs> It was insane. I'm just going to I'm just going to say that um, most insane thing I've ever taken part of. Um, not sure I would ever do it again, but it was uh, an unbelievable experience. But, uh, you know, we went through being lit on fire to being in a, in a container with tear gas, um, tight ropes around uh, across a canyon. We had to repel out of a, a 175 meter tower. Um, and that was after we had a run up the tower with a 30 pound backpack on us as well um emerged in in a in a car and water i mean it was just there were so many things it's uh it's hard to keep track of all the crazy stuff that we took part in
Carly, why'd you do it? You don't need this in your life. I don't get it. You've accomplished enough. You're a decorated soccer player. Why? Are you addicted? Why? To, are you addicted to challenges? I I am. Um, I think for me, it's I'm always trying to find out what what more I have in me and uh, pushing those boundaries. And I obviously was not going to get the the thrill, the adrenaline on a soccer field ever again. And when this came up, I thought it was a, a great opportunity, although I think they kind of uh, spoon fed, you know, the the information that we were exactly going to take part in because I agreed to it and then, you know, got the contract all together. Oh, no, they, li they lied to you? The old yeah. switcheroo, Dan. The old bait and the, the switch. Bait yeah. switch. Yes. But was it the switcheroo or was it the bait, it the and, bait switch? and switch? Wait Dan. a minute. They didn't, how, how partial was the information they gave you on how horrifying these things would be? Well, if you weren't well-versed uh, with the show, it's actually based off the show in the U.K., um, called SAS Who Dares Win. So, you know, I, I'm not able to watch those shows. I don't know anything really about it. So if you didn't know anything about that, um, yeah, you were you were pretty pretty much blindsided going in. And then I happened to get uh, a little sneak peek of one of the seasons that was shot in Jordan from the UK show. And um, yeah, I was I, I was some somehow kind of regretting that that agreement to be able to, to do it. But then I said, you know what? I'm just going to tackle this. I'm going to prepare as much as I can and I'm just going to find out more about myself. Carly, was there any event or, you know, task where you said, wait a second, I'm not going to do this or I had to be talked into doing it? Not one, no. Um, Badass. I was extremely nervous. Um, I'm going to just say I was pretty much shitting myself every moment. <laughs> um, fearing that I was going to die, but then I'm like, hold on a second. They can't allow any of us to, <laughs> right. to really die. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I just tried to to kind of approach it in that cool, calm, collective demeanor that I did on the field. You know, I don't think that many people thought or knew that I was nervous when I took the soccer field, but I was. I had all those emotions. I had all those, those fears and um, the, those nerves, but it, it's just kind of how you challenge it, um, channel it. And, and that's what I did with the show. I mean, I, you know, it's fake it till you make it, right? You just get up there, you do it, and you know you're going to be somewhat safe. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it was not, not any ounce of that was comfortable at all. More terrifying, playing in a World Cup final or doing this? Oh, doing this, a hundred percent. I mean, you have no idea what's coming, ever. You have no idea when you can wake up and have breakfast. You have no idea when you should wake up. There's no alarm clocks. <laughs> um, you have no idea when you're going to get lunch, what you're going to be fed, what tasks you're going to do. You you are literally blindsided every minute of the day. And you have to just surrender to that. You have to surrender to, to absolutely no, no control. The only control you have are your own emotions um, and to try not to panic. That's really it. Again, it's tonight's Special Forces World's Toughest Test. It's Fox's new new reality endurance competition show. The thing that was scariest when they told you you were going to do it and the thing that was scariest when you had to execute it, is the answer the same to both of those? Uh, you know, a little bit different. You know, I uh, uh, some some people feared water. You know, I I was on the swim team till I was eighteen. I can swim very well. I have no issues with water. Um, but but as many have seen that uh, brief showing of me getting submerged in the car, taking that one last breath before you're fully under there, and the car brings you down to a certain point with one of the director staff being down there in scuba gear um, with with air and the receiver. Um, and, and they wait for a certain moment where they tap your shoulder twice and you have to execute. Um, you have to go under there and, and basically hold your hands on the wheel the whole entire time. And you have to execute when they tap you, you take the seatbelt off, you take your hand, you know, obviously take your hands off, take the seatbelt off, and then you have to swim out. Um, for me, you know, that was, that was a panic moment because I had totaled my car in 2010 and went off on some, you know, the side of the highway into some tidal water and 
for whatever reason, that was a trigger. Um, but I think that the biggest thing that struck me is, you know, after we all performed that task, um, some did well, some didn't do well. The director staff guys told us, you know, if you've got two car seats in the back of your seat and you go off into water, what are you going to do? You know, this is a real life experience. And, you know, it all shook us all up. Um, there's no there's no time to panic. There's no time to waste. And um, yeah, that was a that was a really uh, intense moment for a lot of us. That's the doing of it. But in telling you, you have to do this. That was also the scariest that because it was a trigger and the doing of it, both of those things, uh, it was scariest while you were doing it. And it's the thing that gave you the most fear before you did it. Oh, it's, it's the minute you roll up there, you know, it's the minute you get there. Um, the, the DS guys are showing every task that we do, you know, safely showing us, they give us the commands, the directions where to follow every single set of those direction and commands. But as you're watching them do it, you know, that, that they've done this probably a thousand times and, um, they've done it in life and death situations. Um, and so, yeah, the, the display uh, of them doing it. And then not to mention all of us recruits, you don't know what order you're going. You don't know if you're going first, you know, seventh, last. So if you're going first, it's, it's uneasy because you don't really know what to expect. But then when you're, when you're, you know, down the middle and going last, you're watching every single other recruit do this. And it just, the constant fear and panic just keeps creeping in. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's bringing me back to that moment. It was, it was pretty insane. What cast member surprised you the most with their bravery? Um, I would have to say Beverly Mitchell, um, you know, someone who is very small, very petite. Um, I think when people, you know, look at the show, they think that you have to be athletic, you have to be strong, fit. It's not about that. You know, they are they are wanting to see who has what it takes mentally to break through barriers, to push yourself. Um, and Beverly did that. You know, she is an actress. She's always in different character. And uh, I was extremely proud of her bravery to just be as strong as possible, to not fear anything, to conquer her fears. Um, Hannah Brown as well, you know, she's, she's not pegged as a, as an athlete per se, but she's always wanted to play sports. And, and that was pretty cool. Um, getting to know that side of her, you know, having seen her on the bachelorette and, um, yeah, it was just, you know, everyone kind of came into their own and everyone took, um, valuable life lessons away from this. That's, what's really special about it. It's a new reality endurance competition show on Fox, uh, Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. It is tonight. Answer the question now in retrospect. Would you rather go first or last? Mm, that's a tough one because you can pick up on, on people's... That's uh, a tough one. That's what's tough. Yeah. <laughs> that's, right. yeah, that's the thing, that's the thing you're going to be like, no, oh, I, never mind. Yeah, I can't I, answer that. I, I want to hear this answer, though, because this is interesting. I, I don't think I don't think either. Right. Like the first one, you're kind of a guinea pig. Um, you know, when the recruits come down after they've done it, you can kind of pick their brain a little bit. What do you do? What don't you do? But then when you're going last, you know, and then you see if you see everybody being able to, to pass that certain task and then you don't pass it, you know, you kind of feel like a failure. So I don't think there's any good order at all in, in something like this. Who was a coward? I think I know the answer. I do. I think I know the answer, but but I'll allow you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gantz. Uh, you know, Scaramucci. Uh, yeah, uh, Scaramucci. I, I'll tell you what. Uh, <laughs> I, I gained a lot more respect for him. Um, huh? You know, starting off in the show, I'm kind of like, you know, hey, dude, you're you're ranking yourself like really at the, at the strong end of, uh, of of the spectrum here with other recruits. I'm not sure sure you're being honest with yourself, but um, <laughs> no, he, you know, he. He humbled himself. I think many people humbled themselves, and uh, I, I got to give him credit. He, he did pretty well. What do you regard as the most challenging of the physical tests? 
I would have to say the tight ropes across the canyon. So it was basically, you've got rope up above your hands, um, you're fully extended and then your, your feet. So you had to kind of move in unison with your hands and your feet across. And it was, I mean, it was longer than a soccer field. I'll just tell you that. Oh, wow. So it got to the point where I've never felt my arms and my hands just completely go numb before in my life. Um, physically yeah it was just it, it was just challenging so um i would say that one was was pretty challenging and probably getting thrown into the water having to dive into the water off a boat and then um pull yourself up on a rope into a helicopter um you know i got that that upper body weight i just it's not something i use tremendously in in the game of soccer in my years what's it like to be lit on fire <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> I kind of liked it. I, I was a bit what? of a pyro growing up, so I didn't mind, I didn't mind that one a, a, at all. Is that the one you minded least? I think so. Yeah, or the the back dive out of the helicopter wasn't so bad either. <laughs> and the great I, sentences. <laughs> that's but that's what I'm curious about. Like we keep asking, like, what's the thing that was hardest? What's the thing that you thought was going to be hard, and you were like, actually, this is pretty easy, relatively speaking. Uh Back dive out of a helicopter? Is that what she just said? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah, aside said. from the tasks Doesn't and the challenges that, that we had to do, I think the hardest thing for me was um, it was, you know, figuring out when I could take my shoes off, when I could go to the bathroom, when I could wash my clothes, when you could shower for the night. I tried to keep myself as clean as could be, but, you know, I had no moisturizer there, no lotion, no brush. Um, I had some really, really bad athlete's feet. I'm telling oh, you, like, no. I've never experienced that before in my life. I was worried about blisters the whole time in these boots. And here I had some raunchy athlete's feet, um, that was incredibly red and Ooh. pussy and, uh, just, just nasty. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything was, you were just on edge with everything. And just when you thought that you were kind of getting used to the situation, the DSs would throw something at you again. You know, they're like, recruits, get to the parade square. And, and half of us are dressed, half of us are not. And you've got to come fully in uniform. Everybody's got to be in unison. Um, it, it was just, you're on edge every single moment. So that was hard too. You know, it wasn't just the challenges. It was everything else that came with it. Closest you came to quitting? Uh, there was a moment there where I thought, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> but then my competitive juices kicked in and. But what was the moment? You know, um, you know, it, Look, we had to go there. We had to go there five, I think five or six days prior to the show filming. And, you know, you want to last 10 days. So you're already kind of away for two weeks. I mean, those first couple of days, we all felt like we had been there for a week. Um, and and they were long, long days. So I would say it was it was kind of early on, to be honest. It was just, you know, it's it gets hard. You've got no communication with the world. You don't even have a second. I mean, I didn't even have a second to think about my husband or uh, family. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was wild. Did anyone quit? Yeah, we had some people quit. Hmm. Oh, you're not going to name names. I think I know the answer, but I'll allow you. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you're gonna, you're gonna have to all tune in and Piazza. wait each week to see. It is tonight, new reality endurance competition show on Fox. Uh, before you go, though, and I'm glad that we've talked to you for 15 minutes about the show because I am fascinated by just Navy SEAL training and just all of it has always seemed crazy to me. Not so crazy that I ever, would ever want to partake in any of it, <laughs> and any of the training, because I, I imagine they're actively trying to make you suffer, correct? There is uh, there are any number of things that are meant to break you down. So I don't know. You keep talking about things like the details of not knowing what was coming up next, but they're actively trying to make you miserable, correct? With some of the training to break you mentally three days before you've even done the thing that is the hardest of the things, correct? Oh, they're breaking you in every aspect. They're peeling back every single layer. And they're also 
trying to bring us all together at the same time. I mean, we all suffered together. There's no one that will understand everything that we endured. You know, our spouses, our family, our friends, the 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 world, no one will understand. We have that bond because we suffered together. And that is essentially the military bond. You know, no one cares where you came from, what you look like, how much money you have, what kind of car you drive. If you can help save the person next to you, that's all they care about. If you're willing to to die, if you're willing to do whatever possible to help your so-called teammate, um, that's what it's about. So it, it was an amazing bond that we all formed. And, um, you know, that was all learned through the the special Special Forces military training that's been intact for, you know, centuries, um, which was incredible. Which is the closer bond, the one you have with them or the one that you have with your champion soccer team? I'm going to have to say the ones with all these other recruits. Wow. I've never, I've never ever gotten as close to people that I just met. Um, and I'm talking day one, day two. You know, you start just babbling everything you start to to really put life into perspective and that's not to discount you know my teammates that i that i shared the field with but there's just a different different feeling when you are suffering like that with every fear with every anxiety with every panic that you could possibly imagine and uh having to lean on those people to to help you but it does discount what happened with your U.S. women's soccer team. You're it closer does, with Scaramucci. Does, uh, you are. I You're mean... closer with Scaramucci <laughs> than you are. And especially those late teams that you didn't love playing on so much. <laughs> uh, no, it, look, every team, I played for four World World Cup teams, four Olympic teams. Every team was different. Every journey about those championships were different um we all weren't the best of friends when we stepped on that field we all competed for one another and yeah i've I've, i have formed a a special bond with all of my teammates um still rooting for them and and all of that but when you're sleeping next to montel jordan and he's snoring and mike piazza (laughs) snoring um and mike mike piazza is being one of the most annoying guys ever won't stop talking um you know, his comment back is now you all know what my wife feels yeah, like. Great. And uh, I mean, it's just like who who can who can ever say that they've experienced something like that? How it's... can you say that does not discount? You just said a snoring Mike Piazza means more to you. Than I you think it was should, a snoring than, Montel than, 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 Jordan. Well, him too. <laughs> hey, you, 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 Montel Williams. I oh, think. Montel, oh, Montel, Montel, Montel Jordan. Montel Jordan. Montel. 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 This is him. Thank you. Friday night. Yeah, you know, sleeping. I'm sleeping across Mel B from the Spice Girls. I mean, wow. I was a Spice Girls fan growing up. Who would have ever thought I'd be in a tent across from Mel B? Is that um, who you were most starstruck by? Relatively speaking. Oh yeah, she she was awesome. I mean, our corner, our corner was like Gus Kenworthy, Montel, um, Mel B, uh, and then when people would leave. You know, they're caught and their little box would be brought out. And then, you know, everyone would kind of sandwich in together. And each day, you know, the the tent's feeling bigger and bigger with with less people in there. And, um, yeah, it was kind of kind of eerie how they do that. We'll let you go on this one. You wrote a biography when nobody was watching my hard fought journey to the top of the soccer world. What do you regard as the most interesting parts of your journey? Everything. Um, my journey wouldn't be my journey without everything that came in it. Um, can't say that I loved all my coaches. Can't say that, you know, I had the support throughout my career. Um, it was hard, you know, every aspect of it was hard. Um, I felt like it was, you know, kind of me against the world. And, um, I used all of my experiences throughout my journey to just keep, allowing me to grind every single day, Um, never finding any excuses, never quitting, just finding more ways to keep getting better. And um, I think that's what I cherish most uh, looking back on my career is that every bit of it enabled me and allowed me to be who I was. And it set me up now for for the future. And, you know, I'll I'll cherish every life lesson I learned because without it um, and without that struggle, it, it, it wouldn't be this journey that I got to experience. 
You're a badass lady. Thank you for being on with us again. Fox's new reality endurance competition show tonight, Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. Hope we can talk to you again more about your career next time. Thank you for being on with us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Carly. Thanks, Carly. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See ya. See ya. See ya, Gary. Jessica is out on the beach. She has a microphone that is functioning somewhat well, and she has bird poop in her hair yeah. because uh, somewhere nearby a bird just took a shit in her hair. Greg Cody is out there. Shit week is still on uh, here, Dan, at Levitar Show. Greg Cody claims to be more regular than Amin Hassan. We'll have to get uh, that conversation going at another time. Stugatz is out there, and this is what we have in play before I go out there. Joe Buck is not changing his story. Despite a denial from T Troy Vincent, who serves as the NFL's executive vice president of football operations, Buck still says that he was told that the league planned to give the players five minutes after DeMar Hamlin was removed from the field to warm up before starting a Monday night football contest that will have to be rescheduled at some point, one would imagine, and we will talk about that at a later date. Now doesn't feel like the time. Jessica's out on the beach and... Uh, they have claimed they're, the the spotting out there, the measurements, Jessica, the measurements stink out there. We know that it's a hundred yards. How are you guys doing this with rocks no, out no, on the no, beach? No, Dan, the measurements are great. So we have, they measured out a hundred yards with, I think, ten feet at a time with a measuring tape. So a hundred yards is out there. It's the yellow. Um, be careful, the floor is wet. Sign from the Clevelander. And then 25 yards in front of that, I believe, or 50 yards in front of that is the 50-yard mark. It's kind of hard to tell. And then there's another mark that's 25 yards. Everyone's going to throw it past that. That's easy. So we're going to have Stugatz and Greg. We have Kara Kara oranges, uh, very good size for this. Stugatz is going to throw. Greg Cody is going to throw. After, Greg, can you plug what's happening this week on the Greg Cody Show featuring Greg Cody before you throw? Yes, it's a big, big episode. We're ending a year-end bet. We did an emergency podcast on New Year's Eve. We're settling the bet. Did we get Tony Kornheiser on the show by the end of the year? Will I have to eat my toenail in boiling oil or not? <laughs> Everything is answered on the latest Greg Cody Show podcast. Greg, how far do you think you're going to be able to throw the orange? 101 yards. All right. Well, I don't know about that. Greg All right. Counting a roll. Counting a roll. Okay, okay. counting a roll. Maybe he can do it. So I, don't, I, don't I would know. like to point out this is dirty under protest. I would prefer tangerine. It's in the orange family. It's a bit smaller. I have small hands. All right, so guys, has, uh, he's got a six-yard drop back. He's about to take a running start, and he's thrown it, and it looks like with a roll, that's easily ah, 50 yards. No I would way. say that's 50. It went well well past the 33-yard mark, and it's almost to the 66. I'm going to go with 50 for Stugatz with the roll. How is that? Jessica, Jessica, this is Amino Hassan speaking. How far was the throw in the air before the roll came in? Probably 40 yards. I think it rolled probably 10. It didn't look I like much of a throw. It didn't look like he got very much behind it. And if you can imagine that plus a little bit more youth and longevity, I can easily throw it 100. That's all I'm saying. I wanted a tangerine. And what, I mean, what are you doing? I mean, you just storm in here. You're making the rules. We all agree that the roll counts. I threw a 50 yard. I asked like the question. I didn't say it doesn't count. I just asked what was it pre roll Listen, you're, I'm lashing out. It's yeah. very, very sunny out here. And now, like Greg, I'm tired of squinting. Plus, I thought you'd be really happy about pre-rolls. I love a good pre-roll. <laughs> these uh, these athletes, these uh, seminal, iconic athletes uh, who question the toughness of football players and hockey players are saying that their throws and performance are being affected by being tired from squinting in the sun. It is now time <laughs> for Greg Cody. Uh, to go. This is going to be uh, pretty pathetic. Let's see what he's got. This is a, a little worrying because there are some South Beach tourists now walking through our orange field. <laughs> They're and fine. I'm afraid Greg is going to drill one in the head. <laughs> he won't um, get that far. But Greg, Greg is now stepping back to throw his orange. He's he's wearing boat shoes. Uh, he's taking the snap right now. He's lined up under center. Let's see what Greg can do with his orange. Pump fake. Oh, oh, pump All fake. Right. Oh, oh, no. oh no! Oh no! Oh no! He hit, he hit something, oh, and, yeah, and yeah. his orange beard. Oh no, my God! Randy Johnson. He Randy Johnson. He didn't hit a bird. He did not hit a bird. Did he? Did he harm a bird? Peter. 
bird. Greg hit a bird and his orange stopped mid tracks. I think it was actually going to go farther than Stu Gatz's. That's a bummer for Greg. Wow. And- <laughs> oh, but I think when you hit an orange, when you hit an orange, <laughs> the big unit, Randy Johnson, he didn't hit a bird. But when you hit the orange, I think you get double the yardage, right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think Greg's went at least 50, but it veered really far to the right. So who knows how much farther that could have gone. We might have actually even gotten to the 66-yard line. So congrats, Greg. That was another solid throw. Once again, proving throwing an orange. Not that difficult. Tony's going to go next. We'll see how far Tony can Court. throw his orange. No, Tony no, no one asked Tony, but no he's just going to do Tony it. Because- to do this. Right, it anyways, no one, did, no one uh, asked for Tony. <laughs> this is why our video department stinks, because our video guys are too busy <laughs> throwing oranges. All right, go ahead. Say, go ahead, Tony. Not, Cody's got to throw a football. That's the next thing, but go ahead, Tony. <laughs> Let, you you got to be involved. You got to be Tommy Topper on everybody. Go ahead. Is, All right, Tony's taking a 20 yard running head start. He was criticizing the crow hop the earlier. Hop, yeah. There's uh, South Beach tourists wondering why there's oranges all over the beach. <laughs> it's yeah. why is it raining oranges on the beach? Yes, yeah, a reasonable. Why, why? Cloudy with a chance of oranges. Smile. <laughs> <All right. Bile. laughs> oh, big throw. Big that throw. That is far. Big that- throw. Huge. The orange exploded on impact. If it had not exploded, I think easily 100. But that easily. probably went 75. Yeah. It's not that hard. I'm telling you right now, throwing an orange, not that difficult. The three of these bozos did it without even a warm-up. <laughs> let's, see, let's see what Greg Cody, how far he can throw a football. He has claimed he can throw a football. What is it, 50 yards, 40 yards? Greg, how far can you throw the football? God, based on my orange throwing, which, by the way, a seagull walked off with my orange. I don't know what is going on. Yeah. I'm playing this whole game under protest because That's my awesome. orange hit another orange. What were right. the odds of that? Well, no, when you hit another orange in this game, you get an extra 33 yards. Oh, I did not know <laughs> yeah. that. Okay. That is well, a seagull okay. shit on my head, Greg, so okay. we're battling all, right, all the balls. Okay. Greg, let's see what you got with a football. Go ahead. Football. All right. Okay. Get up there. I don't think we're going to do better than hurt uh, than hitting a bird. Yeah, probably should have stopped. Did he hit a bird or did he hit an orange? Wow. Oof. Wow. He hit a bird. He hit a duck right there. <laughs> better with an orange. Throwing an orange easier than throwing a football. Everyone can do it. 20 yards for Greg Cody. Totally pathetic. See you, guys.